way. So when when the deaf experience ended, you, I mean, you we don't need to talk about every sub thing you did because you've done a lot. I remember you did punch. Sure. Rock. I remember you did. Like, there's a lot of different cool stuff you've done. Punch, but, punch. Was, but but the beginning of the the relationship with Devin Townsend after this conversation we'd already had about wanting to do this site, I, I got to admit, dude, and I probably told you this, but when I first heard about you playing with Devin and when you first broke it to me, part of me was incredibly ecstatic for you. And the other part was totally envious. I was like, I wanted to fucking do that with them, but you were already a band. He was, he was already doing strapping on lad. Cause he had the yeah. first out. So how did that really come about? Did he get a hold of you directly? Well, I had a, we had a mutual friend in Los Angeles. It was a, a friend of mine that worked for KNEC radio and um, they might've even still been a station at the time. Maybe, I don't know. Um, we had a mutual friend that was just like, dude, you got to come meet my friend, Devin, and you like that guy. He's really cool. And, and I'm like, well, fuck, I love him on Steve Vibe, man. I watched Headbangers Ball for three months just to see the top of that guy's head. And, uh, and so he had, he had mentioned that, Hey man, Devin's going to be at that Fear Factory Iron Maiden show over at the Palace, you know, later on in the week. You should head down there and I'll introduce you guys. So I was like, well, I'm, I intend to go to that show. So the quick introduction was made. And, and this then, is the old version of Strapping? What's that? Was it the old version of Strapping you went and saw? Yeah, yeah. This was, um, he had Heavy as a Really Heavy Thing out. Right. But he was apparently in Los Angeles living with Boravoy, living with Eula Garrett um writing the city album and you know he needed a drummer and and so it was we had we had set by the end of that night uh, that that iron maiden show we had set up a rehearsal the next week and um and so yeah we rehearsed i remember we did a total of four rehearsals total for for city and this was in february that he and i met so in early march the next week we'd done one rehearsal and then in may we did another rehearsal and when we right before we recorded the album in july we had done two rehearsals so we did a total of four rehearsals for that entire city album and really attracted so really well to me i went you know i went through and listened to a bunch of stuff over the last couple of days you've done and i still you know huh, i mean you know how i feel i mean this is a conversation you and i have had that other people aren't privy to but i just feel like city was the future it was like cinnabites from hellraiser playing fucking metal you know yeah man it just yeah. felt like it was just so scary and psychotic and beautiful um and at a time where i was kind of doing this you know not you guys are futuristic but i was taken forbidden into a a, a different place you know on the green record around the same it was a great place it was it was a great place, but at the time it wasn't appreciated for a, a band like us to basically, you know, I, I'd say the difference is is that you guys were going into the future, and I was kind of trying to take Forbidden into more of a caveman approach at that time. I I, I feel like, well put. you know what I mean? I was like it was sure. like a blunt it was a blunt instrument compared to like super meticulous metal riffs. You know, I was like they were they were hard to play, but it was yeah. definitely a blunt instrument, and it was more. I got more stuff out lyrically. Uh, it was more about, you know, a lot of albums really about my state of mind. I mean, it, it, you Understood. Know, I got to write about me with, with uh, Steve Jacobs helping a little bit for the first time. And of course, Russ and I working together so closely, but so it was different, but you guys, that album, dude, you know, I mean, I love every strapping record, but I keep coming back to that one uh, because I think you guys had a freshness that no one had touched and it's, you know, I, I feel very fortunate to have been, I wasn't there, but I was vicariously living through you, you know, and then you came to my place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and after you'd recorded that album and uh, played it for me for the first time. And I was just like, that's when I was living with Jeff Gomes over there. That's right. The drummer the of Fungo Mungo for all you guys. He's one of, one of my oldest friends, um, another drummer brother. But yeah, you played me that. And I was like, oh. And a Rue Luster. And Rue was living there at the time, yeah. And we were all just a little scared, you know? Like, I didn't know how to, oh, fuck, this is overwhelming. Like, it's just, just so scary. It was like, so that was the future. I feel like you guys forged a, a direction for the future of metal 
that wasn't fully realized or appreciated by the masses, much like Forbidden never really got fully realized or appreciated by the masses. You guys were like almost too good for folks. Hey, fair enough, man. I know we tended to go over a lot of people's heads, you know, and, and as did Forbidden. I mean, it's, yeah. there's nothing wrong with being a really intelligent band that knows what they're doing. But one of the byproducts of unfortunateness is that sometimes, you know, it, it, since it isn't the lowest common denominator, not everybody's going to understand it. But those who, who, those who get it, get it for life and get it, like, get it. You know, so that's the way I always talk about forbidden, you know, totally. In in the case of our bands, you know, maybe, you know, someone will like dig it up in a time capsule and and, and understand it more later on. You know, you might might dig it more when I'm dead, you know, you might understand what we were doing here. But uh, yeah, you guys were just, you and Devin together and and, and Byron and Jet, uh, who are fucking ace dudes who I I love, loved all you guys, but still love present, present tense. And seeing you jam this year. And, and and being able to stand with you and take that only picture of you guys all together until other yeah, people. Man. But that no, was like a full circle moment for me, dude. I I my I feel like Strapping on Lad was the best uh, extreme metal band in existence. Better than Mashuga, in my opinion, because he had hooks. Better than any of them. I don't think there you were the best, you know. And that's no, I, was, how I feel. I appreciate that, brother. Yeah, I. I Never going to back down from that opinion because I haven't heard anyone do it better. Nor will I. Darn too. Yeah. No, you know, and I know that it, 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 you know, there's a lot attached to it and you, you spilled your guts. You lived up there in Vancouver and, you know, lived on couches. You did the couch surf tour. Just yeah, to, man. Just to make art. <laughs> Indeed. Absolutely. And, and I wouldn't change any of them, you know. Uh, it, I, but I know, I know that you felt, you know, at the end of it all, it, it stuck with it stuck you in a bad way because you, you, of course, we feel gypped when we don't get to finish what we started. Uh, not, and yeah, that was that was essentially it. I always, I always knew that I was going to land on my feet, um, but it was for me. It was just kind of like the timing of it. It's like, damn, we worked our bags off for a dozen years, and now there looks like there might be some light at the end of this tunnel. Only. You know, our guiding light was running out of gas, you know, and Devin and I totally understood. And that's why I could never really fault him for, you know, I, I never faulted him for, you know, I was like, dudes, I, I'm, I can't do this anymore. I was, you know, I, I had to rely on my feelings of, well, Dev, I appreciate you coming back. You know, I appreciate you trying to give strapping the old college try and we got an extra five years out of the band that none of us were expecting. So I'm, I, I appreciate that. And that's kind of the way I, I left it. You know, I, I, I evolved pretty hopefully quickly enough into it. You know, it was, it was upsetting, but it was also like, okay, well, you're just, you know, you're going to land on your feet and you're going to start, you're going to enter phase three of your, of your career now. And this is going to be a really uh, gene centric you know, portion of your career, you're going to put yourself out there more so than you as the guy from this cool band or that cool band or that cool band. You're going to start putting yourself more out there and do some DVDs and be a clinician and, you know, just whatever it is that I do these days. Um, it well, was a... Before we, before we get to that, because I yeah, want to get to that, and I just want to just kind of wrap up, because there's, there's a lot of years in here where you're still with strapping and stuff, but I, I want to say that... Uh, my first real meeting of Devin, you, you and I think it was believe is you and Byron were driving either down from Vancouver or up from LA. And you, you remember you brought him here. Well, I yes. in the house. And I you remember that well. Infinity record. And I think, I mean, I'd seen you. I, no, I hadn't, I had not seen you guys play live yet. No, nope. because uh, we didn't go to the Dynamo and see you at Dynamo yet. So, so my my first introduction to him, this this guy that I was like, who man, you know, like you know, I don't get nervous or anything, but I was like, I really am excited to meet him. You know, he's uh, he's gonna be a handful. He's you're giving me like a little foreshadowing, like yeah. But yeah, he came to the door and he just looked like he was like uh, uh, medicated. Yeah. You know? Uh, it, it was lithium. Uh, I don't remember what it was, but there was a lack of medication because 
what we were doing down there is we were over at Jason Newstead's pad for a couple of days. We were supposed to spend a, a week there writing and, and working on the Physicist album, what later became the Physicist album, but it just wasn't working between Dev and Jason. No. And one issue that Dev was having was he was pretty fresh to medication and he left his medication behind on that trip. So a lot of it was phone calls back home. And this was 1999, I believe it was, 98, 99. Um, and it wasn't like you could just, you know, go pick up some medication. He was, you know, lots of phone calls back home. How are we going to get you your medication, Dev, by the time you even come back here, going through customs, all that stuff. And so I, yeah, I think when we showed up at your pad, um, yeah, he was just wiped out and just his body was just like discombobulated from I've been on medication for a certain amount of months now. And now I'm off it for this week. And I was always like, Dev, you don't need that shit. Man. You're just you're a young dude. Yeah, he, he's stuff. the kind of guy who needs medication or needed it back then. I think he's got a handle on it. But it's funny yeah. you said the thing about Jason, because I, I the only time I've ever worked with Jason, I went there one time. I don't know if you know this. Um, but I went to work at Jason's place at the, for the possibility of starting a band with him and Eric Kretz when Man May God broke up. Okay, yeah, sure. But he was just like recruiting ideas and people. And I could see right away, right away, that this was a guy, Metallica had A, done a number on him, you know? Yeah. And, and B, he wasn't really, because he'd been in Metallica, he wasn't really in a position to like really want to listen to anyone else, really. He wants Fair to enough. Metallica so I know you know so we I remember uh Eric and I walked out of his place like we sat in Eric's car we were like that was fucking weird right right <laughs> right that was that was I was the most disconnected and so I can imagine a guy like Devin who's you got just you know just jumping with genius completely overwhelming uh Jason I don't no. see Jason like being able to even because well, the shit we were throwing at him was way too deep, and it was like, you know, you know what I was writing at that time, and I you sure, and it was, you know, I, I was writing some pretty massive rock riffs, and he's like, can you play it more like stoner rock? I'm like, what do you mean, everything around the twelfth fret and open tuning? Yeah, I can. yeah, yeah, right. I can, but you know, I got other ideas. And I said, I have a picture here of, uh, I still got a picture of that day, as a matter of fact, right there. If you can see, oh, uh, uh, there you go. Yeah, man, look at that. It was weird, but. I still have hell of respect for Jason, you know, but of so course. getting back to you guys being at the house. Yeah. Uh, you had informed him about how loud my new stereo is. And uh, we I remember this well. record, dude. And, and so we cranked it at like 1130 at night. Right. Open the back doors, the back windows behind you over there. Yeah, the back door. I think we, we just, it was down the valley. Had, we had to have been into over 130 decibels in my house. It was, and I remember you going, man, I've cranked some stuff up in here. But I remember that was like, Ur. no, well, here's what happened. Here's, here's, you know, we, we turned it up to a fucking level, right? And I'm like, I'm like, he, I, he's like this. He's starting to pass out. He's all, and he's just getting a little bit, you know, that little bit of drool on his Yeah. Head. I think, I'm like, I think he's out enough. I look to you, I'm like, well, let's turn it down a little bit. And as soon as I turn it, he's all, wait hold on he's all turn it up i'm like oh shit it's like, <laughs> we just, and we we that to this day that was the loudest my stereo has ever been you know i believe it yeah we and it sounded amazing and that record's amazing and you know you were so proud of it because you got to do rock you know it was like more of a rock thing for you and everyone sure, kind of, absolutely you're like you're like typecast in metal yeah you're a well-rounded you know real season the listener of, of great music so of course you're going to be able to play rock but i but you know Devin doing rock because he's 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 told me numerous times you know it's just a rock record you'll like it and i'm like nothing the dude does is just a rock record <laughs> yeah indeed. right i can write just a rock record because i don't have that you know i don't have that extra thing in the musical like uh, theory knowledge and all that that he does but i think when you know so much you can't really put the genie back in the bottle yeah indeed man absolutely but uh, knowing so much you know so that was a great moment and everything you did with that band i find fucking 
groundbreaking, dude. And uh, all right, I'm on, brother. Forward to you. Well, I, I want to talk just a little bit actually before I fast forward it too far. Around yeah, the man. same time, you did the demonic record, and you were staying at my house. I was. You helped me survive. Like you have no idea how much you helped me actually live. We, we, <laughs> you, we, we adopted you. That was when you became a real Bay Area fixture for a long period of time and everyone in the Merv guys and you know we just you know you're already lovable but then here you are it was like you're that was when our video game uh like oh yeah man critical depth critical depth uh, twisted metal 2 to start then critical oh depth. that's right yeah yeah were we doing um double o double o seven golden eye yet was that happening you had you were starting it because that was the super ninzy and I remember when, uh, yeah, I think, uh, what, Merv grabbed one of the click clicks for shotgun. Right. right. Yeah, I remember that. But, uh, yeah, it was definitely Twisted Metal 2. And what was it? Uh, Precious Seconds. Oh, Precious Seconds. Yeah, that was Mike Mandis. He gives a little like, drama to the son to this day, yeah. So, yeah, you know, I mean, just these, you know, you, people – get to know each other over the years and you know the, the people pop in and pop out but you and i have been like you know we talk about conversations to pick up where they leave off right oh absolutely brother yeah man. And I are the easiest flow that's why i thought you'd be the perfect guy to start this uh you know this whole uh address the uh, living thing yeah you know, that's fun I feel like this is, you needed to be that guy gene because the history that we have um, and the friendship that we have is, is absolutely bro translates way beyond just music it was a lot of time spending talking about life and yeah you know laughing and you know our, our wives and girlfriends becoming great friends and yeah man absolutely you know i mean you yeah you're very important so we'll move on to demonic tell us a little bit about that how did that process even happen well i remember Chuck had given me a call and said, hey, man, we are, uh, Eric and I are, are, you know, we're not sure about the future of Testament right now. So we think we want to carry on and call the band Dog-Faced Gods. And I was like, okay. Now I that get was it. Contos's idea. Was it? Okay, well then, oh, interesting. Um, he's he's the one who told them you should probably like, pack in the name Testament because it's, it's, it's mud for the moment. Yeah, okay, well, that's, I, that makes a lot of sense, um, but, you know, Chuck said, hey, man, you want to come up and, you know, do some jamming, check it out, feel it out, and I was like, absolutely, man, let's see how it goes, and I think at some point earlier than July, I think maybe I had gone up for, you know, a, a couple of days and done a little bit of noodling with Eric and, and stuff. And it looked like it was going to work out. And so Eric's like, Hey man, why don't you come on up over summertime? And I remember the day I arrived, you and I, and maybe somebody else, we went to go see Pantera. That, oh, like, Eddie, Eddie Kohler. We went up and saw them after, right after he had the, uh, Phil had the a week after. Yeah, man. Like three days or so. Yeah. It wasn't a week. Yeah, man, it was just a couple of days kind of thing. I remember we were chatting with Rex after the show, and Rex was like, dude, it's a weird period right now, man. Mm -hmm. Things are crazy all over the place. But uh, they but had, yeah. had uh, all kinds of counselors with them, and it was like, yeah, uh, it was like it was before some kind of monster. Like they were all traveling with them, you know. Like, yeah, man. Everyone's got their, their counselur. Yeah. Crazy. The they were living in the bubble. But anyway. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> man. Anyway. So yeah, Chuck had said, man, come on up, let's check it out. And I, you know, I think we had it worked out that it was going to be about a six week, you know, blah, blah, you know, we're just going to take a six weeks to rehearse, you know, we'll do some real good rehearsing, six weeks to rehearse and, you know, get the drums done in that six weeks as well. I was like, oh, perfect. And then it evolved into, I don't know, like nine months or something crazy like that. Like, Jesus, man, that was a struggle. But, uh, you know, because they were they were in between deals at the time, and this you know this wasn't a vibrant period for the heavier side of metal, definitely in '96. So, um, you know, I had just tracked uh, City from Strapping, and I noodled on up to the Bay Area, and I, I over the course of all that time, you know, I was keeping in, in tight contact with Byron and, and Deb and things like that from from Strapping, and and you know, they were letting me in on some of the uh, 
you know, goings on that were happening for strapping. Like, hey, man, we're, you know, here's the release date. And then here's going to be the, we're going on tour pretty much right when the album comes out. And I'm like, cool, you know, uh, because at the time, strapping was a total, like, this was Devin's last project for last strapping album. He's like, I'm, this is it. But I, I talked the band into becoming a band while we were tracking the city. Like, dude, we should try to take this on the road. So, Anytime any kind of anything would come up with Chuck or Eric, like, hey, man, maybe we can all hit the road or something. I was like, hey, just remember, guys, I'm you know, cool and all, but I'm in strapping. You were loyal to strapping like I was loyal to Forbidden. Fair enough. Yeah. And, you know, had I known then what I know now, it's like, dude, do both. You know, you could yeah. easily, uh, I thought you could out to pick one. You know, it's like me, me too. That was a that was an old mindset of the you know eighties and nineties that kind of fell sure. away over the years. Yep, and you know, and so that's why it was like I was always trying to just leave the gentle reminders. You know, like hey, just let you know, you know, I'm 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 a strapping guy, and so when it came time to I guess doing the announcement or whatever it was going to be, I remember you know Metal Maniacs. We were going to have a dinner with them, and I had mentioned to Chuck that. You know, Chuck had picked me up, and he's like, dude, we're going to tell, you know, Metal Maniacs tonight that, that you're our drummer. And I was like, well, Chuck, hey, man, you know, I, 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 I've not changed where I'm standing at. You know, I'm, I'm with strapping, and we got a whole bunch of stuff planned. And so Chuck, Chuck handled it totally cool. Like, okay, well, hey, man, that's, that's you know, all good. You know, hey, Gene, it would have been cool, but you do your thing, and we'll, we're going to be okay. And I remember Eric was just a little taken aback by it he was a little surprised by it but uh you know we that demonic album was such a departure and that's why i'm I, i'm remembering it's like it was going to be called dog Face gods for some time because then like deep into it into that nine month period or whatever it was about halfway through chuck had come to me and said you know, and we were writing all this like pretty you know, just, it wasn't testament sounding material, especially from the last, you know, like kind of album, a couple albums ago or so, or even it didn't sound like low, didn't sound like ritual, definitely didn't sound too much like the earlier thrashier testament. It was like a band trying to find their way and evolve and, and work their way, you know, back up to the top again. Well, I could tell you, it's fucking heavy. That <laughs> is heavy, heavy, heavy record and some of those songs still translate live as to be in the like you know pulverizing points of the show i don't know if you do them as much anymore but for a few years we don't year, do them at all i've never played i've been in the band for nine years now exactly there you guys did never done one it's it just you just run the intro like there's there's something you guys do the six 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 thing like i wish you know i, I wish maybe, maybe last did you time come did. Did you come down to a rehearsal this year? Did you did you come yeah, down to a rehearsal? Yeah. You came down and hung out. That would have been what you're thinking of, because that's the only time I've ever played anything off demonic was during those rehearsals because we were running we were gonna run demonic refusal and maybe uh song number two from the album, whatever that one's called. Uh oh, fucking hell. Uh Burning Times. Um we were gonna play, you know either one of those and you might have been at that rehearsal and that might be because i'm like oh yeah. so, but those, i mean i'm just listening to it today it's still it's still forged in my memory it's seared in my brain brother like yeah. the, the, there's some really great stuff on that record and you know i mean that was a short-lived thing so you never really joined the band we'll just move no. on to that but yeah. you you gave you gave a good portion of your life to it and i i remember you just being a little bit raw about that too like you know, I was here doing this this whole time, and uh, you weren't making much money. Like, nobody was making much money back then. No, and I, you know, and that, that is understandable. I mean, you know, they, they, there was no money. You yeah. know, I, I was living on $42 a week, and 27 of that was going into my gas tank. You know, because I'd fill up the tank and go to all the rehearsals. And so, yeah, that was, it was challenging. It was, it was just a rough time living on 15 bucks a week. It taught me a lot for when I moved up to Vancouver. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, this, that's where a lot of like the community that you had out here, everyone, you know, like I said, you were you were like a Bay Area fixture for a period of time there, where you made some great friendships out here, man. Absolutely, absolute brotherhoods, man, familyhoods, big yeah. time. Totally. As as good of friends as we were before, 
that's where you and I became better friends. You know, absolutely. Like, the notion yeah. never, never had a crossword. Never, you know, just, just existing like we do. Yeah, so, man. I'm glad. I'm glad that you did that experience though, because like I said, it brought that whole thing together. And, um, you know, I think you moved. I, I remember when you guys first did the, the touring for strapping is what we, we could talk about a little bit of that dynamo thing. Cause, um, I remember you guys, I, I thought I was going to go to dynamo and then I found out you guys were playing and I was like, Oh fuck, finally, get, you know, finally get to see them. And I remember, uh, I don't, I don't remember every, like every performance of that festival, but it was a really good lineup that year. It was a really good line. Was that the, that wasn't the year that Danzig got in that shin. No, that was when I was there with forbidden, I think. Because they got in that big shindig fighting with Andre and they had to close the gates on him because they wouldn't get off stage on time. Different thing. Oh, crazy. No, I watched bottles being thrown and it was it was wild. No, but that was when you guys played a junkie XL. Oh god. Like, they Jesus. put you on the industrial stage. Okay. People considered you industrial. Like Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, you guys were just punishing. <laughs> oh so punishing. And and sticking out, you know, so much. And I remember seeing Seven Dust for the first time there, and they had an incredibly like they were cool on stage, but they had like no guitars in the mix. And you guys were the, like the exact opposite. It was like guitar, fucking, ooh, yeah. Just like I just remember that whole. I bet the haunted that night, didn't we meet? That's where we met Tom Angel Ripper from Sodom. Nice, you and I. Yeah, the, man. And then you were explaining to him the whole Sodom says thing. You're all, no, you got to understand Sodom. It's like, because we were trying to explain to him how Sodom means different things to us in, in the Bay Area. Because we say sodomy this, sodomy that. And then he's just like, do you remember that at all? Because he's like. Vaguely. I remember Sodom. Yeah, like, you sit on the bed yeah. kind of looking like this. He's all. Then after a while, he's all. So it's funny. They're like, yeah. And he's like, okay. That's funny. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, he's never said a word to me ever since. <laughs> really? Oh, uh, wow. I ain't no thing. I, no biggie. Yeah, well, that was just just an amazing uh, – it's your first time in Europe with them, right? With strapping, yeah. No, that was – nope. We had done a tour in 97, and then we did more touring in 97. So, yeah, that, we had been touring over there a couple of times. Okay, well, it was at least the first time I got to see you. Yeah, it was added added to my life changing experiences with the band, you know, <laughs> and hanging with you guys was great. Yeah, man. So it was good to be see my friends out there, and I was out there pushing man made God demos, God, yeah, which were like super super raw, you know. But it pay it paved the way for a lot of other things. But so then after you, after you did the stuff with uh, a couple, you, well, dude, you had years between strapping albums like we did yeah the chicken feathers syl album that was like six years or five and a half years between records let's see 97 for city and then 2003 for yeah man pretty much to the day so six years to the day that album yeah that album really knocked me sideways so and my head was in such a different spot because we were doing the man made god thing and i was yeah man uh, I was like, you know, basically writing fucking rock records. And I remember hearing that album and going, uh, I can't comprehend it. It was just so much for me. But actually looking back at it, it's probably the least dense and most. Yes. Uh, it's very, it's very good. Like, very, oh, cool. I think that album has got some of the best riffs out of all of them, to be honest with you. But it was, nice. I know the story like because Jed was telling me a little bit about it and how uh, basically you did talk uh Devin into doing that correct I mean he he kind of wasn't even he didn't do any samples or anything for that album no and I I wouldn't I don't know if we talked maybe Jed talked him into it but it just kind of seemed like we we were on tour in 2001 late 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 2001 and then Devin came to us on that tour and said let's write a new strapping record I'm ready for this and so we took the first few months of 2002 to do it and we tracked it in 2002 um but it was an album that we all got involved in you know Devin had written City and Heavy is a really heavy thing on his own and we all had a part of writing the Chicken Feather album and and 
Alien, and then you know, New Black to a, to a large degree, it was it kind of became a band. And I think it was Devin going, well, if I'm going to come back, I don't want all the workload. I'm going to lay some of the workload on you guys. You know, if you want this so bad, you jump forward with some of your ideas. And we did, and they were good. That, you know, Chad wrote a bunch of great riffs. I'm writing choruses. I'm writing riffs. I'm writing lyrics. We're all, you know, we all, it was kind of a, it, it was a band, you know, kind of on the Chicken Feather album. But it was definitely least, the least dense album. It's a very incomplete album, in my, in my opinion. Uh, there's no samples, you know, and part of the big thing about Strappy was the sample. So it just sounds kind of bare, kind of naked. And the guitars got to have just, and the drums, you have room for both of them. So, maybe, you know, maybe for the way you listen to it, it might be different. Like, I, you know, how people listen to Forbidden is much different than me because I remember how it was done. You can't really erase that from, you know, it's just always in your subconscious. But I, I listen to it now and I get that album way more way more now it's just such a punishing guitar riff record you know ah, cool man yeah, excellent you know, and it was so tight like you know um and that would be a big uh big testament to uh jed you know jed's amazing right hand just yeah man absolutely guys together you know and, and i gotta give a lot of gotta give it up to byron too man and he was the first guy when we were you know even up to green maybe a little bit before green, I started telling Matt, I, you know, you don't need to pick every note, you know, sure. and, you know, it goes boom, 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 you know, like it, it started to like click. So you guys had influenced me. I don't think it cool, man. definitely influenced the writing on, on Omega wave much later strapping that came into play the way the approach that I, Matt took to bass and stuff like that. Cool. And then, but that's much, much later. But anyway, so we're we're moving on. We'll just keep moving through here because I, I, you guys kind of came to. You came to a, a head sooner than it probably should have. But I saw you guys, uh, do one of those morning shows at Sounds of the Underground when you played in the Bay Area. You played like eleven a.m. or something, and I just remember I, I'd seen you a bunch of times since then. You know, we hung out numerous yeah, times man. when you played with Shuga, when you came around and played with uh, with Kill Switch and Gage. I think you played the Pound and. Whatever. So, you know, the, I had all this history and all these times seeing you and each and every time was an experience. But that time in the Sounds of the Underground was great because, you know, uh, Devin did his berating in the morning. Uh, yeah. It was like brunch berating with, with Devin Townsend. And That's pretty was, awesome. There's great footage on, of, uh, I don't know if he did it every night, but I found some footage of that show where he's berating this guy. He's like, yeah, you, you, the one, the retarded looking one. He's just like totally politically incorrect. Oh yeah, and it was just—it was so amazing to watch. That. I was big, most I smiled standing on the side of the stage ever. Yeah, and, man. But you were running around before that show, saying, "Yeah, I got to do uh, Opeth tonight." I'm like, "What? What? what are you doing?" You're like, you're yeah. listening to Opeth in your head. You had your first show with them, right? Well, it probably happened a few a, a few days or weeks or because I remember it was Tulsa, Oklahoma that was the first show that I did with them. But we were probably on our way out to the to the West Coast run there. And I was they were, they were probably like, hey, let's try this song tonight. So I'm probably like, okay, we'll learn this one because I've only been doing this for about a week or so. <laughs> we filmed the video the day before kind of thing or maybe it was a day after something. Well, you're a guy who doesn't really turn down a challenge and you've sat in for a lot of people over the years like on the fly and we will get to some of that too but did that one kind of throw you for like oh shit these guys are like another level of this you know well i don't think there was any time to even give that concept any thought it was just hey man my pals Rock and roll. i can do it you know it's like you got four or five hours to get this set together bro so get on it oh and there's an unreleased song as well so get it all together and try to pull it off and and that first show we we did you know it was pulled off and and each each show just got easier and better and and but i had i think we had they probably played you know they played definitely a few show we the tour had played it a few shows before then so I caught every minute of their set. So I already had, you know, the songs already being downloaded and into the, into the, into the brain there. So, um, 
And I had played one song with them uh, a year or so before when they had passed through Vancouver. Same situation happened. They did not have Martin, their drummer. And uh, and so I, had, I, I got a call from their management. And so I immediately called Ev because I didn't know Opeth at all. You know, I just knew that they were the, you know, very mellow band that we've done a few shows with. Um, and so I called Evan and said, hey, man, what song? You know, Opeth just called and wants me to play a song with him. What should I play? And, and he gave me the song title. It's a song called The Drapery Falls. And I was like, ooh, I can recognize that one because that one sounds like, you know, King Crimson. And it sounds like one of your songs, Ev. But we had that one song experience a year or so before. But this was, yeah. you know, another bunch of tunes on top of that. So That's just a band. Uh, they're a deep track band with... You know, but I, I don't think their drums are the hardest thing about them. So I suppose. I mean, they, oh my they, God, their drums are amazing. Their drums are amazing, great. but are they the hardest thing about them though? I mean, I think they're well written parts. I think they're just really well. You know, to do them well and to pull them off, you need some time. It's because I like I still don't know how they recorded some of that stuff. It's like, Martin, are you that amazing, or was it a matter of? Bro, go out there and play this beat for a half hour. We're going to record it all. And we're going to cut a little bit of that. We take a little piece of that. I'm still not sure to this day, but they are very challenging to pull off drum wise. There you, you go. Know, well. That's about as big a compliment as you can get. If you're, if, if, if you're telling me that they're that challenging of parts, then I, I have to say they must be fucking challenging. Well, let's move on out of Opeth then. Okay. Real quick, the, the easiest part about it was Martin was telling me before he left the tour, he was like, dude, I just based all my drums on all the shit you did with F. And I was, and when I was learning the songs and I was like, okay, I know there's going to be a fill coming up here. It was like the fill that I would do in my brain is the fill that he's doing on the, on the record. So I'm like, Dude, this is, I get what he was telling you, you know, for the last couple of weeks of the tour. I understand that now because this is what you feel is about to happen. And sure enough, there it is. And this is pretty much the first time you're paying attention to the song. So, uh, so there you go. But that's pretty fun. Uh, it was, it was very impressive. Uh, that made me a fan of the band. And, and Dominic, my son, who, you, yeah, your Uncle Gene, my did. nephew. Yep. He loves Opeth. Cool. He also has a porcupine tree, which is a newer one for him. But uh, he's, yeah, uh, he falls into these things on his own, you know, like what he likes, what he loves. So that's awesome. one of the things. Yeah, but we got a bunch of Opeth on, on vinyl now because of him. He orders that I, I'm not the guy who orders their stuff. But, so, but uh, <laughs> so, you know, strapping kind of ends finally, like you said. And it was, I don't know how ceremonious it was, but it, it, it ended and then uh, how much of a lull between strapping and you finally getting to hear from uh, Brendan Small and when did he get a hold of you first or did who got a hold of you for that? Well, I think it was, um, it was about, let me see, our last show with strapping was August 13th, 2006. And by October, that's when Brendan reached out. I, I, I think I got a call from, somebody sent me an email or something like from maybe century media or nuclear blast somebody and said, Hey, man, Brendan small, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him and I'm well familiar with it. Um, you know, he's looking to reach out to you. Do you mind? We give me your number. And so I got a call from Brendan. I remember I was out spending a month in Chicago giving, um, giving private tutoring to a, to a student. I remember yeah. that. Yeah, man. And, that, that, uh, you just, you just sparked a memory that I, forgot. yeah, Spent a month out in Chicago t tutoring one dude, and um, and I got the call from Brendan, and he's like, "We, you know, we got a good budget, and um, are you interested?" I was like, "Absolutely, you know, yeah, totally." And I was familiar with the show. It, the show had only aired like two or three episodes at the time, and I knew there were episodes coming on that very night. So I think it was going to be the little three block of here's some episodes. So I watched those and. I, I, I got to admit, I was kind of like scratching my head at some of the humor. I mean, I the first thing I saw was, you know, the bassist was puking into a bucket. I'm like, oh, okay, well, it's going to be, you know, 
heavy metal puking and you know all that sort of stuff and i realized pretty early on that that it's no it's that's it's it's got more brains than that oh yeah but the music was killer so i was like i'm in absolutely yeah man let's do this so that started off the old death clock phase there it was cool but when you got in and actually started really recording them it was really cool like you know i i it started but i the humor i got it right away too i i thought it was hilarious um and i you know i got to tell you from my point of view here's another one of those moments where i was so happy for you and relieved because i was like it seems to me like gene is finally finding calmer uh people of his at his level <laughs> yeah, when i finally I met the guys i was like oh yeah this is this is perfect for you because it, it just seemed like for the first time in your life you had uh what's the word i'm looking for here some sort of uh stability around you you know sure. like, it wasn't it wasn't just this going on over here this going on like these dudes uh are are pretty much all geniuses you had mike keneally with you uh you know like all these like I was like, who are, when I first saw you guys come around live and you yeah. played the college, right? That's you right. College show for that, for that adult swim tour. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I so envy this situation because this is like people that you want to be around all the time. Yeah. yeah. Not that I can be around other people, but I, you know, I was like, man, these guys like seem just like it's going to be a blast for you, especially where you come from as a person, I thought. So that, I mean, Am I right about that? Was it always kind of chill? You guys probably never had any problems on that tour or any tour with each other whatsoever, I would imagine. No, gosh, no. Every, you know, everybody's super cool. And, and you know, like when, when Brendan and I recorded the album, he had yet to have uh, Mike Keneally or Brian Beller a part of it. That came later. Because originally I was, right. I was, I was, I pitched, I called up Brendan and pitched him dvd as a, as you know as a, and and bobby coble as a as his guitar dudes and he was like oh, i already got a guy named brian beller like okay mm, not sure and mike keneally and i'm like that's the old frank zappa guy okay and then i know he was with uh, the zappa sons on the z record that was the first time i i saw his name and i knew he does stuff with steve Vai. um but it was so mellow you know everybody just nice nice people and and you know Brendan and Mike Keneally would be watching the Dick Cavett show at night, you know? Uh-oh. Still, still my favorite pair of all time. I know, so you're not on Twitch. I'm still doing an interview. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh my God. Hi. Sorry. Oh, Craig's saying hi. Hi oh, there. Oh, you're, you're, I, I had no idea. I'm so sorry. Just making sure everything was all right. All is well. It's all part of the interview. Oh, no worry. He's talking right, to you, sugar. You guys have fun. Not a lot. <laughs> All righty. I love you, girl. Bye. Yeah, she's like, I notice you're not twitching because I'm, I'm easily forty-five minutes late to my twitch. Uh oh. So, well, uh, I better hurry up and move on to some questions. I got to finish up here then. Uh, I no, no worries. I I should text one of my guys and one of my mods and say still going, but. Uh, but just running late. I mean, just let them know you're. Yeah, you're doing. You're doing uh, a, a groundbreaking, revolutionary thing. Uh, that's right. Called an interview on the internet. So, uh, but anyway, so we'll 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 kind of move through this because I, you know, I mean, here you go. I've seen you guys a bunch of times. It was great. I know I took Dominic to see you guys when you guys played uh, in L.A. When you headlined over Godsmack and. Um, and oh yeah disturbed and all that God, stuff. That was so yeah. intense there's the, they lit the fire in the center of the pit out there in the middle God, that was crazy <laughs> irvine was that irvine meadows or something no that wasn't irvine it was uh, that was at uh glen helen which is blockbuster pavilion and now it's some named after a casino or something but that's that was the same venue that they had the us festival at way back in the day the big famous us festival that you wow. might see on VH. Well, it wasn't a venue back then it was just a piece of land it so was a piece of land, of land and that they had it on. Stuff. And yeah, then, that was great. well dominic i took dominic to see you and uh it was ironically testament played that day and we watched him on one side that's right we went to go see that too Saw everything else machine had played that day like you know it was just like kind of a cool really cool gathering and then you guys just just crushed it i that was the first time dominic had seen 
like we're standing on the side of the stage and there's things that he had never seen before. Yeah, sure. Some pretty explicit graphic things. And I go, Dominic. And then before I even say he's all, I know dad, it's not real. <laughs> awesome. I was like, okay. Was that, but he's like six, maybe seven years old. Cause that was a long time ago. Yeah, that no, was 2011. Was it? No, it was longer than that. Wasn't it? 2011, January. Made him seven years old. Yeah, there you go. Still, you got to see Uncle Gene for the first time, uh, and that was deeply impactful for him. He, he definitely awesome. loved that. So, I'm going to move on back a little bit to the day that I first probably hinted out to you that I'm going to need some help with this forbidden thing because I people don't necessarily know how you came into being the guy to sit in on the very first forbidden gigs after X amount of years. Cause right. it didn't really, you know, as much as it was exciting for some folks, it didn't register on the, this does not compute. You know, they're like, eh, this is not, you know, this is not all forbidden, <laughs> but they got to understand. And I'll, I'll just give the background that uh, we, when we talked about reforming, the original idea was to reform with a twisted in the form lineup with Paul and with Tim Calvert. Then as soon as uh, we had, we were putting out the feelers about that, Testament heard that we were going to have Paul and they needed a drummer. So they immediately went in and headed off at the pass and said, we need you for this new record and we need to start pre-production and everything and the writing and all this stuff now. So they wow. they blocked him from being able to do the forbidden thing, not by saying you can't, but just by simply being a part of it, he couldn't, right? So... He's like, sorry, guys, I can't do that. So then the, you know, the idea of uh, Steve Jacobs was the next one, and it just didn't make sense. He wasn't living there. He didn't have a drum set. He was still getting over shoulder injuries. I think we, you and I had talked about that. It's like, it just doesn't matter, sure. dude. Like, the only other guy I want to do this is you, and we'd only played in death, you know? So yeah. you get the call from me. Like, what was, you know, I mean – I remember, I just got to say one more thing. I remember the one thing that you were hesitant about is how much rehearsal I was like, we got to rehearse this amount of time, dude, because these guys have not, they are busting out of mothballs. You know, I, yeah, I was sure. the only guy that was still playing all the time. And uh, I remember that being pretty like, that's a lot of rehearsal. Are you sure you need that? I'm like, me? No, but I mean, yeah. the band needs it. Like we needed to rehearse. Fair enough. Go ahead. You it take about a month or something. Something. It was. It was like Pretty almost hearty. three weeks. It was a three solid, solid weeks. Sure, I remember that. Yeah, totally. So you go ahead and you know take it from your point of view, like what how how that all went for you and what you were thinking. I was stoked getting to play with one of my effing favorite metal bands of all time. I was in pure heaven, man, and I just wanted to do justice to all the great drummers that Forbidden had had. And, you know, here you and I were getting to hang out a lot and I got to play with you. I, you know, my respect for you as a musician is, is off the charts. So I was super stoked. And my main, my main, I guess, goal from a, you know, stand in drummer's viewpoint was get the parts, you know, like, cause people, this is going to be Forbidden's, you know, return get the parts down don't just be like oh just do some hoagland things no become paul bostaff for the paul bostaff material become jake stevens for the jake stevens material <laughs> and uh you know become steve for this stuff and you know i i loved green from a drum standpoint oh, oh god i love that album so i was stoked to just be a part of both i, I love both drummers but uh you know it, that was the main goal is serve the songs like they should be served you know if, if you know and and both drummers have such a a decidedly different style but they both work so amazingly for forbidden music that you 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 have to a you know pay a good homage to both men as as musicians to make this you you just want the listener to be able to just like close their eyes and and Go off to that place where they were at when they were hearing the songs for the first time. That was all I was trying to do. Was just trying to, you know, pay pay a good tribute to both 
both drummers. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you certainly did that. And, um, you know, I mean, when we got, you know, Paul Bostaff had such a, a huge shadow cast over the band because he joined Slayer. Like as soon as you joined Slayer, we were, the Forbidden was pretty much dwarfed by the shadow of Paul right from that, just, you know, just from the public's point of view, which he's totally, Fair enough. And, and, you know, I don't even think we had resentment over that. We kind of knew, like, as soon as Paul joined Slayer, like, well, it's either going to help us or it's going to not help at all. You know, it was like, we didn't really know how that was going to land, but Steve Jacob, you know, Paul had his style, which was so bombastic and in the studio, he didn't necessarily know exactly what he was going to do and things just happened. And okay. that was his charm. You know, he knew some things he was going to do for sure. Like he had 90% mapped out, but some of those drum fills were like, they were just moments of time. And, you know, so you had that. And then when we got Steve, he was a guy who was like calculated and had groove that we never had with Paul it was a different, different vibe altogether. Fair it, enough. So smooth. It. So what, to me, since getting to have you play the material, I was like, in, in my mind immediately, I was like, this is going to be good because I uh -huh. knew that you were going to smooth out the old material too. And you did, you didn't, you, you kept it legit. But you did, you was you, dude. It was all you. I mean, I, I, I feel like that version of the band was on cruise control, you know, like we just got to fly and we got to do it again. You did those first, what do we do? Like a warm up show and then another warm up show, like out in Davis or whatever, Chico. And then we Something came like that, yeah. shows at Slims and it was just like, my God, we were fucking flying. And it had the smoothness of, of, of Steve with all the fucking power of Paul. So it was, it felt like that I was like getting really excited. I'm like, I wish this could be the band going forward, but I yeah. knew it was borrowing you. There's no, there's no competition between what you had going with, with death clock at that time, which was your main priority. Sure. And, um, and I was just like, yeah, fuck, I was getting spoiled. I was like, and yeah, for the people watching this, you know, as much as Gene and I play together, we have never sat down and wrote. I know, right? Crazy. It is crazy. It's kind of bullshit, especially in this COVID times. Like we should probably, you know, I should throw you some riffs and you should track some stuff and then we should just do that. But anyway, so it was a, it was a huge honor uh, to have you in the band. But something that concerned me in that period of time was your health. Yeah, man. It was, you, you know, and I always told you, drummers in Forbidden fall apart. I told you beforehand, I'm like, you're going to play for a while. Things are going to start hurting. It's something about what we do. I don't know. And I really couldn't say it was that because you had other things going on. Because you, oh, yeah. you had a di diabetes thing that you did not really have diagnosed properly. And so, well, I had been diagnosed, but I was not doing any, doing anything intelligent to deal with it. You know, I'd be like, oh, fuck it, man. Big deal. You know, and so that was very stupid on my part but uh yeah i remember when it culminated in slims man you know you know i would get these seizuring cramps like kind of the same thing you were saying earlier you wake up with and these were just like just a seizure through my entire body sometimes it's legs sometimes it was in the gut and i remember that i think it was, we might have already played maybe we hadn't played i remember we were doing two hey, you played you're standing in the doorway after we were done with your arms yeah. hanging up just trying yeah. to stretch myself yeah, you're like oh i'm like oh shit and that was the same night that fleas got almost arrested and all that shit had happened because that's right yeah i remember that yeah. in the boys room you know so yeah there was some uh some i remember deep, that totally deep, yeah deep arms going off for me and i was like so worried about you and then you know you met laura yeah and your life, dude, has been on the straight and narrow, clean, living, fucking healthy living ever since. Darn tootin'. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be with, you know, my, my unicorn, you know. And it was, I had, like, it wasn't an overnight thing. We, we got together and I was, you know, pretty obstinate in my ways for a couple of years and then finally when the doctor i'd i'd come back from a fear factory run in brazil uh, in, in south america and we were going to the meat pits every single night you know the churrascarias 
And when I got back, Laura was like, whoa, dude, I've seen you on tour. I've seen you come back from tours for the last couple of years now. But man, you have really plumped up, man. Like, you gained 20 pounds down there. And I had a doctor's appointment scheduled. And I went and the doctor had said, if you don't, uh, you know, if you don't start changing, making some serious changes, ASAP, by the next time we see you, you're going to have to start jabbing insulin. And I was like, man, F that. I came home and I told Lara about it. And she's like, all right, F that. It's, it's, it's over. Like, you're now going to listen to me. And she's been a health nut her entire life. You know, she's been super healthy, super health conscious, always eating all the right stuff. Um, and she's like, I've been patient with you for the last couple of years and yay, it was fun, but now it's serious. And I'm going to put you on a plan. You're going to listen to me. And within three to six months, you are going to be diabetes free. And oh yeah, by the way, you're going to lose a bunch of weight as well. And I just never really back off that plan, you know? And, and when I was staying with you, I was even just talking about this the other day, we, we bought some broccoli and I was like, Craig's the guy that got me into broccoli back in '96. Oh, like, yes, I know. Broccoli. Yeah, man, you you would snack on broccoli, and so that was my snack for the longest time. It's like, well, I hate vegetables, but I could deal with broccoli because Craig got me into broccoli, and so that was kind <laughs> of my first bridge into like the healthier aspect of things. I, I need to get back into chopping broccoli. I need to get back chopping. <laughs> yeah, but yeah I, I I do smoothies these days, like a. But anyway, we, we can talk about health another time. But Indeed. bottom line for me is uh, through that experience, you gained enough maybe fear of like realizing, you realize, you had a realization that you needed to take care of yourself. Like, sure. you know, and thank goodness for Laura coming along in your life. And as I said earlier, my wife, Alice, loves her so much. And they, oh, she loves Alice. She loves both of you guys. You send stuff to each other. You know, there's always like, yep. Oh, I got this from Laura. Oh, I sent her this thing. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. You know and, and uh, that's what, that's what the benefits of getting older and taking care of yourself in this business is you get more time with your friends, you get more time with the loved ones. And, you know, thank God we have these women like this too. I mean, Darn too. And absolutely. And I see, you know, what a, what a remarkable, remarkable impact Alice has had on, on your life. Like you guys are a couple of babies. Jesus, man, you guys, you have an age of it, brother. Well, you know, like, I don't you know, know all that. She, oh, she's always been like, it's in her, it's in her genes. Like, yeah. To look so young. I have to really work hard to take care of myself these days. I, and that's something I did, you know, the superfoods thing has been helpful too. Yeah, man. But yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I stepped it up a few months ago. Adrian from uh, At The Gates uh, put me on a push-up challenge, just a lame Facebook push-up challenge. And I was like, I was mad at him. I was like, dude, you know, you just put me on blast in public. <laughs> but I mean, it's funny people are like, wow, that's so cool he chose you. I'm like, no, here's what happens. You have a list and you're like, oh, who can I do today? Blah, you know, okay, I'm done with that. It's like, it wasn't like he thought I'd stick with it, you know? Yeah, sure. And I, as, as a consequence of him doing it, it started challenging people and no one stuck with it but me. Nobody stuck. And I still, to this day, it started with 25 a day. And that was the first day was one struggle. And then the next day, and then I was doing a hundred a day, six days a week, no matter what. And then I'm doing yeah, man. days and, you know, tons of sit-ups and just stay you inspired me in this way. You inspired me in this way because I might not have had the health problems, but you look great, Gene. You you take great care of yourself. Your you know, your brain has never taken a step back. I think you know. I mean, but you, it's thank you, brother. I want to do this for a long time. And yeah, man. I want to make music, and and I don't know what the world holds for guys like us uh in the future with no touring for the time being and so you just make music and you just want to feel as good as possible i'm not willing to throw it all in the toilet uh for you know just to eat whatever i want and never exercise you know what i mean like it's time yeah, to man. Ourselves. so thank you for your inspiration to me in that way oh uh, well thank you brother man like i said you were a big part of my early inspiration with the broccoli like having that as a snack man that was that was a big help you know so yeah, I'm right back at you, brother. I have the one broccoli story. Uh, I thought it would be a good idea to buy broccoli from an organic place one day, which, you know, I did. And uh, I used to always, oh, I don't, it's no pesticides. Cool, man. 
So I always would just like, you know, if it's no pesticide, I could just eat it, right? So then one time I'm, I get it and I'm just chomping it and I look down and it's just covered in aphids. Oh, man. I was like chewing away. Like, oh, oh. <laughs> I didn't oh, barf, but it kind of scarred me a little bit from the broccoli, uh, the organic broccoli side of things. Hey, like, fair enough, man. Aren't all bad. Okay, so before we wrap this up, because I feel like we've covered so much, dude, and I wanted to talk yeah. a little bit about the Fear Factory thing, but that was such a blip, you know. I remember we got to play with you guys on the uh, 70,000 tons of metal. That's fun, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I had the only line six on board. And I so Dino was like, you got a line six. So I helped him out, and he uh, he put his settings into my amp and all that weird stuff, and that was cool. Uh, but, I mean, I don't want to get too much in that. I, It's not it's not a huge portion of it. But I, I, I we'll – We'll move to like Testament now. Yeah, man. You know, if you would have known back then, like that you were going to end up being in the band. Cause I remember when they first approached you, you're just like, you're thinking, yeah, you know, it might be something I do for a little bit. And here it is. You've, you've gone through three full album cycles, full album cycles. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, you are it's been, we coming up on 10 years almost like eight God, years? jesus yeah i guess so it was yeah no, october of of 2011 that you know i came in and sat in for for johnny p and it's you know for the most part it's been it's pretty simple and cakey and easy and and you know i i know I, the, that recording of the brotherhood of the snake record was very challenging but i think everybody's kind of just kind of moved on and and it's you know it's testament's a very quality act i like the way they tour we're all we're all pals everybody's friends i love the crew i like the touring aspects of testament it's uh it's like they're the the tortoise and some of my other projects are the hair but there's always going to be testament touring and stuff so it's, it's pretty simple and like i say we all get along and, and it's a it's a nice it's a nice gig and and you know i enjoy it and you know, I, I do know that Testament likes to tour and I, I, I am aware that, I, well, I'm only assuming because we don't stay in super tight contact, me and Stevie T are more in contact than anybody else, but, uh, and we're more in contact from the death to all side of things, really. Um, but, you know, I'm sure that once, once the, once things start acclimatizing themselves towards more road work for all the bands, I'm I have no doubt that Testament will be, you know, one of the first ones out there. I can only imagine so. So, um, well, yeah. which brings me to the fact that, you know, as I informed you last week, um, Testament is on deck to play the new Dynamo uh, next year. And that's going to be with the act that I'm doing, uh, which is the Bay Area Interthrational the same day, which is why I'm doing you. Know, they, it was going to be the headlining act of Last Dynamo, but that obviously went to shit. So we'll see if they have everybody inoculated in time to go, because I'm sure yeah. that's the sticking point. Which I would imagine. Back, brings me all the way back around to conspiracy theorists. Yeah, right? I like, totally. Okay, okay, conspiracy theorist. Are you willing to take the shot to go back and do what you do for a living in our genre? You know, in our, in our business, you got to kind of go, am I going to, you know, Polio was a, you know, made up de democratic conspiracy. Like, no, you needed a fucking polio shot, bro. You know, sure. like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? So if we want to go to Europe, you and I are already going to be inoculated. That's you know, what I figure. And Dress the Dead is playing the day before. I think when you're traveling, from what oh, I understand, you yeah. have a show. Oh. Actually, you have a show two days before. And they, they were talking about uh, sending me over to that show. And then you guys would come. I still know week. nothing. <laughs> I don't know any of those. You, you, you're telling me all this right now. I got no idea. I, I believe don't think anyone in your band even knows anything more okay. than Dynamo. But this is like the organizers of Dynamo, because like, they want oh, to get, they want me to get you guys involved. Which is, of course, if you're if you're there that day, I know you'll play for sure. I'd love to do it. Absolutely. Want everyone to, but no one can. The whole thing with the Bay Area International or Interthrational is that no one can play their own song. Fair so enough. If you're a forbidden song. I will not be playing it. I know who's going to play drums on it, though. That guy. Oh, yes! 
Yay, so, so I win! You get, awesome. to do, you get to do the one or two forbidden songs, depending. We get the uh, same amount of time as you guys, like an hour and ten minutes, whatever. So, Kick ass! Well, you pick the songs, happens, I'll be down for playing them. If it doesn't happen this year, it'll happen the year after. But this will be Dress the Dead's first time uh, in Europe, and all of our music's going to be out, because by the time this comes out, they'll, it'll already have been announced. But uh, We just inked our first deal with Nuclear Blast's uh, digital, Blood Blast. Um, and we have not made an announcement, but we're going to be releasing one song a month incrementally and a bunch of other things with it all the way up until we get to Europe and then the full length by the time we get out there. So our music will be heard for the first time ever. This band will actually have everything out there on all platforms. You know? Kick ass! Congratulations, yeah, it, brother. It, you know, it's about as good as it gets now, Gene, because if it, the way things are, if, if we're talking about, uh, you know, record deals and taking money from anybody and stuff like sure. that, it's like, what are you doing? You know, how are you going to earn that money back? You know, like, yeah, there's no man. scoring. You're not going to, so we're just going to do it just digitally. And then we're going to, we're going to, we negotiated a little clause in our deal, which makes it so we can basically do whatever we want when we're done with it, where other people on Blood Blast don't have that. So we'll Alrighty. just one eight song obligation. And then we're free. And that's well, kick ass. So what that means is if if we do well, we do well. You know, if, if we build up into a point where we're, someone wants us and the touring world's open again, then we'll we'll do that. Otherwise, we'll just keep releasing stuff through them. You know, that's kick ass, man. Well, we're psyched the, about that. So which uh, my last thing is you finally did get to see Dress the Dead last year with Death Angel. Yeah. And it was kind of an unexpected, like, here I am. Like, oh, shit, okay, he's in town. We're all going to get together. I know you surprised some people at the show. That's right. And uh, it was fucking amazing seeing you there. But, I mean, you know, you saw us for the first time. What was your honest value? I mean, you don't, you probably, you just go ahead and just lay it on me. Like, what was your kind of first I, impression of the band? I, I loved it, and I thought there was so much power coming from the stage that it's like capturing that was incredible. You know, seeing you guys on stage, there's just you know the live, the loud, the the energy that's going on is was was remarkable. I I thought you guys were amazing, man. I dug it. I I always dig you, you know. And I thought you you and Kayla had a great uh, you know, rapport together, you know, you, you're, you're you, the way you guys are play off each other. And I really dug all the energy. I, your songs are killer. You know, I, mean, I remember there was a moment there where I was going to step in and play a play one gig with you. And so I learned all your material back then. And I still remembered it during all of this, I'm pretty sure. So uh, that was pretty amazing. But I, I really dug it, man. I wish Dress the Dead the absolute best. Absolutely. Well, we've grown a lot since, you know, because we had Peter Dolving to start with. I appreciate all that. We had Peter to yeah, start nice. with. It was just me and him kind of sending ideas back and forth, riffs, you know. And then and then I get Mark Hernandez, who was in Forbidden, you know, after we went, after you finished your initial stint. And then you came back because Mark had personal things going on. So I was wondering, how surprised were you when I told you, you know, I'm going to play with Mark again? That probably had to be like like a little bit of head scratching for you. I, 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 a little bit, be, but then I was like, well, was, might, might Mark be a, uh, you know, um, like, like hanging out with an old pal, playing with your old pal, somebody you play with a lot of times, uh, you know, a lot of the time, a lot of the years of late, but then what happens, you know, is Mark going to be able to hit the road and all that, you know, those was all the questions that I had, but I'm like, you know what you're doing you know I mean, whether this is going to be you know fully permanent with mark or like yeah mark's helping us out and we're gonna hit the road with somebody else then okay you know i, I figured so you know what you're doing the hope was always that you know uh life dictates like what your choices are you know like if things are going well then it becomes a choice like you have to make this choice but you know uh i i the main thing is i fucking love mark and i love writing music with him the way we wrote Omega Wave, uh, the last Forbidden record, was the easiest out of any record to write because the approach he understood me. He, he, he like Steve Jacobs, he speaks my language. Excellent. He knows my musical language. And yeah, man. He you know, apologized to me about everything that had happened, and he had personal things going on in his life with his marriage, 
And that was the reason why it all had happened. And once you make amends like that, you know, there's really no reason to, to, you know, hold anything against the, for the past. So that, Absolutely. that opened all the doors and the music we've written with Dress the Dead has been, dude, people don't even know, like, you know, you know, you know me by now, there's a lot of detail work and a lot of things that came to pass later on. And this whole new batch with our new, cause you saw us with our old guitar player, Dan, who was an amazing guy. But That's right. He's an incredible player, shredder, songwriter sound collage guy too so it's been like this last year has been like hmm, it's been and then all this happened so we're we're sitting on it we're, we're the next record after this is going to be all that all that in a bag of fucking chips you know well i cannot wait to hear it brother absolutely you guys are gonna be on fire so it's gotten made us closer you know but yeah, I know Mark thanks you for for helping him out when he fucking couldn't do it he's like dude I oh, fucking my, love my you. pleasure Say you bailed his ass out a, a couple times. Yeah, no, they not the man. I just you know, thanks for letting you play your kid there, Mark. Totally. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I don't play with people unless I, I I I give them all I got. And you know, playing with you was one of the biggest thrills of my life, bro. And uh, right back at you, brother. Absolutely. One because it happened a few times, but every time I played with you has been a big thrill in my life. And and I can't thank you enough for being part of this maiden voyage of oh the, yeah man dressing, happy to do it brother dressing the living dress the dead <laughs> uh, it's not That's a podcast funny. yet we're just going to keep we're, this is going to start with youtube and we'll probably move it over but looking at how long this has been three hours holy moly crazy. we might get this into three parts or we just might run it as one but we'll, we'll figure it out and we'll tell you when it comes on the air Absolutely. Whatever you feel is the easiest ingestible for folks, run with that, man. Absolutely. Yes. You just heard it here. The, a word that was invented for this, American, <laughs> whatever, I almost said podcast. But yeah, yeah. Man. Hey, man. Much love to you, dude. Have a good Right back at you, brother. All right, brother. Thanks a lot for All your right, brother. Right. I love you, man. We'll see you soon, brother. Love you too. Yeah, man.